So we've got two tools, radial velocity measurements and transit measurements. And between them, we find that there really are planets. And we can actually measure not only their mass, but their radius. So does that mean it's all solved? Well, I personally, Paul, would like to know a little bit more about things other than these giant Jupiters, things about smaller planets. And then I really kind of want to know what's going on on these things. What are they made out of? What's going on? in these planets. Yeah, I guess a smaller planet that one might, might potentially live on would be nice to know about. Uh, yes. Uh, so why can't we just find smaller planets with transits? I mean, in principle, well, we could look for really small dips and see really small planets. So the problem we have, once again, is our atmosphere. And so this is a movie of what a star looks like on the atmosphere, uh, yes. going through the atmosphere. We've seen this before. Um, and we, it moved things around from pixel to pixel, so that's why we defocused the telescope to average over that. Right, and so the reason why it's doing this is because the atmosphere is really, uh, is really bubbly and turbulent, and those bubbles of slightly warmer or cooler air act as tiny little magnifying glasses, effectively. So not only is the star moving around, it's becoming brighter and fainter at over a rate of like, you know, a thousand times a second, it changes. So it's a real Yeah, it's problem. kind of like if you get a, a bunch of cold air going in front of the telescope, cold air is denser and so it bends the light more, has a higher refractive index, so that focuses the light in the telescope and makes something appear brighter. If you get a bubble of hot air coming across, that has a reverse effect and defocuses it. That's right, and so it's a problem. Now you might think we can just average over things, right? You go through and, okay, don't take a picture every thousandth of a second. Take one for an hour, and presumably the average will be okay, but it turns out you need to even observe longer than an hour because the atmosphere has doesn't just do this. It changes over all types of, uh, of, of frequencies, and so you really are stuck. Yes, yeah, so this change in brightness is something you can't fix by defocusing the telescope, and it doesn't fix very well by having very long exposure times. Yeah, you can fix it a bit, but ultimately... You just need to somehow get rid of the atmosphere. So how do we get rid of the atmosphere? Spending a lot of money, it turns out, and going into space. That's the best way to do it. So this is the uh, um, Kepler space probe. Uh, people have realized that to get these really accurate transits, they need to go into space for a while, and a number of missions have been planned or launched. This is the great granddaddy of them all, the most powerful one, NASA's Kepler mission. What this does, it's specifically designed to go into space and look at lots and lots of stars and measure their brightness with the exquisite precision that's only possible when you haven't got this bubbly atmosphere in front of you. Right, and so this telescope is a little different than the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope is able to go through and it, it essentially magnifies the stars to what we would say the diffraction limit is, so as good as it can see. This telescope doesn't bother doing that. It says we don't care about making a precision uh, picture of each star. What we want to do is just measure how bright it is and not have that messy atmosphere. And so it actually, you know, each star comes on and uh, really is a tiny little point and you can't actually see that much information on each, on each star. Yep. So what it does is it's basically spent three years pointing at the same bit of the sky. Uh, it's got lots of different detectors and so these are the places they look at in the sky uh, up in the northern hemisphere and it just stares at about 140,000 typical sun-like stars for three years. And it's, it, it sees with each one of these images, which is made up of a bunch of different little detectors and mosaic together, it sees this huge uh, piece of sky that's like 200 times bigger than the full moon simultaneously, all out in space. So it is really a technological marvel. And you can see the quality of the data it gets. Here is ground-based observation of a given transiting planet. And so here are all the different measurements. And you can see there's a fair bit of scatter, and that's because of this atmosphere jumping up and down. And over here, you can see there's the transit, and the points have moved down. And if you average over them enough, you can see clearly there's a dip there. But it's all quite grainy. Now look at this with Kepler. This is actually some of the very first data that came out when it's yep. only been up for a few weeks. And the scatter is almost gone. It's still there, but very much smaller. You can measure this with absolutely exquisite precision. And the amazing thing is the technology used here and here is almost identical. It's really the same type of detectors. The problem is the atmosphere. It's not like you know going to space and you're doing you're spending a lot more money. Well, you are, because you've got to get it to work in space, but it's really the same stuff. It's not like there's anything magic in what's being put up there. So, with this exquisite precision, 
from the ground, you're lucky if you can measure the brightness to better than 0.1% uh, or so. Yep. Um, whereas Kepler was designed to get to better than uh, maybe about 50 or 60 parts per million. It's not going to quite achieve that. It may be more at the 100 part per million. Um, but that's still an awful lot better than you can possibly do from the ground. It means you'd have to observe essentially a thousand times longer from the ground to do as well as you do at Kepler. And even then you probably wouldn't. And even then you probably wouldn't, that's right.